He is LA's longest tenured sports broadcaster, ranking up there in the Pantheon with Vin Scully and so many of the greats from the Los Angeles area. Welcome to Leaders and Legends. Ted Sobel is joining us. Ted is the author of a new book called Touching Greatness, Tales from the Front Row with Heroes and Legends. So many, in fact, too many, Ted, to speak of, even in this segment. I don't know if one book was enough. You might have to do three or four volumes of Touching Greatness, but you've been in Los Angeles for so many years, rub shoulders with the greats of the greats, Magic, LeBron, Kobe, Wayne, I don't know where we begin because do you ever sit back and kind of pinch yourself that you've been basically on a daily basis been touching greatness? Well, first, thanks for having me, Garrett. It's totally a pleasure to be here with you. And um, I don't know if I pinch myself uh, because I'd probably be sore if I kept pinching myself, but I could tell you that that's pretty much the reason why I wrote my book because so many people, have said, Ted, you got a story about Joe DiMaggio, about Ted Williams, about Babe Ruth, about this guy, and Jackie Robinson, and Don Newcomb, and Elgin Baylor. It's like, well, you know what? I think I'm going to write a book. And by the way, thanks for the open. Uh, the other two volumes are already written. So <laughs> this needs to be, this needs to do well. And the other volumes will come out already pre-written, ready to go here. Well, that's interesting. And, and I guess it, it, let's say, let's face it, Ted, so much of it has to do from your vantage point. You're in the heart of Los Angeles, one of the biggest media, um, you know, markets in the country in the world. In fact, you're, and you're in the thick of it. You've been in the thick of it for so long covering all of the major sports, you know, hockey, baseball, football, basketball, what is it do you think your perspective gives you, your vantage point gives you that, that the average fan doesn't get to see? Well, I think, first of all, I'm very lucky because I've had the opportunity to cover varied sports. You know, if you're a beat writer and you cover the Los Angeles Kings, you're stuck on that beat for the rest of the season. So you don't get a chance to go to a golf major or a tennis major or anything else or a Super Bowl, for example. There's no way because you have to be there to cover your event. So I've never been pigeonholed that way and luckily been able to cover everything. And I think the advantage is that I'm up close and personal with these guys. And I don't like to just ask the typical question. I want to get the personal view of everybody if possible. I want to get their feelings about what's really deep inside. I don't want the, oh, well, I gave it 110% response. That doesn't work. Well, Ted, I was going to ask you that. What's the secret? Because we see so many of those athletes being interviewed and how do they respond? Well, you know, we got to take it one game at a time and we just got to go in focused and it's the old Bull Durham interview, right? We just got to, you know, uh, the good Lord will and things are going to work out. How, how do you as a reporter help an athlete get around that? Well, first of all, I pay attention to the game and try not to give the generic question, but you also have to listen. If you're not the first guy asking the question, listening is what it's all about. I don't have to tell you, you're already a great interviewer. If you don't listen, you can't have a great interview. It is totally impossible. So uh, if I'm listening to the post game in this case, where that's what we're talking about, might be in a clubhouse or a locker room, whatever, uh, I'm paying attention to what the guy is saying. And he might spur a really good question that I want to give him that he's going to give me a kind of response that a 12 to 15 second soundbite is going to be a little bit different than others. And I've always prided myself uh, by guys saying, hey, I'm going to use your question. That's that's the one I want. And thank you very much. I, I'll bill you later. <laughs> Ted, you know, we see you with the NFL and with Major League Baseball and, and in the big leagues, as it were. But take us back to the minor leagues where it started for you because our mutual friend, Brian Pataffi, who's out there in Chilliwack, BC yes. speaks very fondly of your days, very, very early on, just learning the ropes. Tell us a little bit about what it was like for young Teddy Sobel to work his way up. Well, first of all, I, I want to say that Brian is such a special guy and we had an interesting relationship because he was with the Utica Mohawks of the Northeastern Hockey League. And I was with the New Hampshire. We moved it at midseason at the, the Christmas break. 
New Hampshire slash Cape Cod Freedoms of the NEHL. That was the year after Slapshot was made. And I have a chapter already written for a following volume of Touching Greatness. It's called Living Slapshot. And I recall one game happens to be in Utica where Brian was, and he remembers it well. And it was the late part of the first period when one of our players was in the stands because he jumped over the glass uh, to find his brother was fighting with a fan there because somebody threw a hot drink at him. There was two brothers on our team. One was not dressed for the game. The other one was in the game. Somebody threw a hot drink. I don't remember if it hit him or not, but uh, he saw it. He ran around the rink, jumped on this person. Before you knew it, half of our team was in the stands and uh, half of the Utica police force was on the ice within about 15 minutes. That was and I recall everything. And I get great responses from not only Brian, but uh, uh, some of our own people, uh, you might remember, or if you don't, Cap Raider was uh, a WHA goaltender and was the assistant coach for Barry Melrose with the LA Kings. He was our goalie then. Uh, Alan Golbensky was a tough guy. Paul Stewart was an NHL longtime referee. He came the next game, but he had some comments about that. And Johnny Cunniff, the late great John, a RIP, he was such a good guy to me. Uh, he was our coach and GM. And uh, I just recall that one game and people, after they read this, I, they're going to say that's impossible, but nope, it happened. And guess what, Gare, not only that, but the visiting, I'm the visiting announcer and I'm sitting up in the press box and the other beat writer for the local team was not there. Somebody filling in for, he wanted to fight me while I was on the air. <laughs> Because I'm talking about my team. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, Ted, I already know we won't have enough airtime to fill this segment no. of Leaders and Legends, but I do have to <laughs> ask you about this. Yes. How valuable was it to learn your craft in the lower levels and get very, very good? I'm trying to picture, you know, a young early 20s Teddy trying to figure out how this whole thing worked uh, and, and how does it relate to other professions? In other words, can you weigh in a little bit on how important it is to pay your dues and learn your craft? Yeah, it's a very good question, Garrett. I think one of the things is that I learned my craft before I got my first job because I spent six years of sitting in the stands, literally just practicing into a tape recorder, cassette in those days, of course. Uh, I went to probably an average of 40 to 50 games a year at the old LA forum with the Kings hockey and Lakers basketball. I would do the same with Dodgers games, probably 60 games a year. We would sit in the stands, me and my buddy, Paul Olden, who's now the PA announcer for the New York Yankees. And we would sit and practice night after night and critique our tapes on the way home. So it wasn't just going to the minors. It was okay. Now I'm in the minors. I feel like I'm fairly well seasoned. Now I'm doing the real thing. And obviously you got to get the rust off and really learn what a professional is being like. But I think it does. Uh, I think it does affect other people in other phases of work because you have to know what you're doing. Once you start your career, you got to ask people. I had some great mentors, Chick Hearn, the greatest basketball announcer of all time, Jiggs McDonald, who's a great Los Angeles Kings announcer, the first one there and following him, Bob Miller. I think it was really preparation that they taught me. And hey, preparation has to be in whatever job you do. If you're not prepared, good luck winging it. You know, and, and that, I mean, again, we could speak for hours literally on that subject, but I do want to dive into the book, the book Touching Greatness. And in some way, even though you never saw him play, by osmosis through your father, I know you feel the soul and the spirit of maybe the greatest of them all from the house that Ruth built. Tell us the story of your dad and how he passed along the love of the legacy of Babe Ruth. Well, it's one of the special stories in the book for me, no doubt. And uh, anyone who's read my book, or I could tell you in advance, that a lot of it is based on my father's influence in my life and what he meant to me. He died when I was just before I turned 20 years old. So I missed out on an adult life with him. But my father, as a kid, had real issues at home. His father was very abusive to my grandmother. And my dad had to go out and work. He literally, physically, my dad 
kicked his father out of the house when he was 12 years old and says, you're not going to treat my mother like that. And my father had to get a job. In those days, you could. As a teenager, there were no laws. So he got a job at Yankee Stadium selling popcorn and Cracker Jacks and peanuts in the stands when Babe Ruth played. It was 1931. And when he told me the stories of what it was like when the babe came up, my dad would say, I'm in the stands and I'm selling whatever I could sell. And then you would hear in the background this murmur of the fans saying, here comes greatness. And you talk about touching greatness. When Babe Ruth was in the on-deck circle, you could hear it throughout Yankee Stadium. And my dad would stop selling for a few minutes, turn around and watch greatness. And when the babe walked up to the plate, he would tell me stories of the place was bonkers. It was just like, here he comes, the greatest player of all time. Certainly of those days he was, wasn't even close. He was the Wayne Gretzky of baseball before Gretzky was born. So yeah. but one of the stories that my dad used to say was when Babe hit a home run, he would look into the stands when he was running around the base. You could see old films and everybody thought he was looking at them. And that's what Babe Ruth meant to everybody in New York. You know, that's such a great story, Ted. And your book is filled with these types of stories that people really do get a sense of. Because as you were telling the Babe Ruth story through your dad, I can't help but think your dad must be very proud that you're carrying that legacy forward. Well, uh, one of the things my publisher said to me was, Ted, whatever happens with your book, your parents are going to be proud, even though they're not here anymore. And that made more to meant more to me than anything. It's my legacy, whether I sell two books or two billion, um, I feel I got my story out and I think they would be proud, no doubt. There's a, another story and I want you to expand a little bit. I mean, we could tell many, but I've, I've cherry picked a few. I, I've just, sure. I just want to give uh, our viewers here a sense of touching greatness, which is the spirit of the book. Let's talk baseball since we're still on the subject of baseball. I'm just going to say two words and you take over. Vin Scully. The greatest of all time in any sport by far. It's not even close. As good of a broadcaster as there's ever been. Uh, you know, you can throw all the superlatives out on Vinny and he's just as good of a guy. Uh, I believe he just turned or he's either 93 or about to turn 94 soon. Um, I talked to him some months back. He's doing well. He lost his wife this past year. So he's going through a difficult time in that respect. But when I grew up, Gare, going to the Coliseum and then later Dodger Stadium, I was one of thousands and thousands who had an earplug right there. And all we did was listen to Vin Scully in our transistor radio. He started that more than anybody. And I, I got a chance to tell Vin one time in front of a crowd at a sportscaster's luncheon here in L.A., I got up and we had an award for our radio station. And I said, I just want to say while Vin is here. Vinny, do you know that I went to sleep with you every single night with that earplug stuck in my head? And my parents thought I was sleeping, but that transistor radio was right underneath the pillow. And I didn't leave until that postgame show was over. And that was every, I don't care if it was 15 innings or a five-hour game. It didn't matter. I was going to listen every single night. And Gare, let me tell you something. Not only was he a great play-by-play -play guy. But when you're a kid and then you eventually think, hey, maybe I can do this one day, there's a lot of him in me that I've heard over the years, which definitely comes out on occasion. I wish I was him. I will never be him. But I, you know what I'm saying? There's Absolutely. There that you can't erase. And I don't want to. That's a, that's a fantastic tribute. Uh, here you are in the heart of Hollywood, La La Land, Sunset Strip, and yet you're also a huge hockey fan that dates back to the LA Kings, the expansion Kings, Terry Sawchuk, uh, Jack Kent Cooks, the owner, Marcel Dion and the Triple Crown line with, uh, you know, uh, Dave Taylor and, um, and Charlie Simmer. And yet Wayne Gretzky, Captain Canada. Is there a way you can describe the impact Gretzky had when he came to the Kings? Well, I went to that news conference that day, and it was one of the all-time classics. It was fascinating to see all the non-hockey folks show up at this news conference, and it became, it was an event. It wasn't just, hey, we got a new hockey player in town. We got Babe Ruth, and that means a lot, and especially a place like Los Angeles, where stars mean a lot 
to the folks that's spending their hard-earned dollars. So when Wayne showed up that day, uh, it was at a hotel down by LAX, and I'll never forget it. It was such a zoo, and you can hear the camera snapping. It sounded like somebody shooting a machine gun off in the background. And it was constant stuff. And I, I got an opportunity to interview Wayne a little bit afterwards, but I'll never forget the emotions from him and your entire country. Because I got calls from radio stations in Canada. It was as if your prime minister had just been assassinated. Mm-hmm. That's what it was like. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I could be, I remember one of the uh, headlines in one of the larger newspapers said 99 tears. I'll never forget that. And I, I was thinking I could feel those 99 tears every time I spoke to somebody in Canada. It was like you took our guy away. And Janet Gretzky was like Yoko Ono, which was totally unfair, by the way. So uh, to me, it was it's too bad that you feel that way, that we didn't do anything wrong. But guess what? We changed hockey forever. No Mighty Ducks, no Atlanta Flames, no Dallas Stars no Arizona whatevers, they would never have existed. Not certainly not then, if not for Wayne Gretzky. You know, uh, not too long ago, you might, I don't know if you know this, but the Wayne Gretzky rookie card. I heard this. It went for $465,000 in 2016. And by 2020, it fetched 1.3 million as, as the value of Gretzky and the legacy of Gretzky continues to expand you mentioned southern belt hockey tampa bay lightning two-time stanley cup champions uh mighty ducks as you mentioned san jose sharks the seattle kraken yeah they're a little bit north but i'm just saying and florida panthers Panthers and and uh and all these other teams uh how do you look back and assess the legacy of gretzky and the impact on hockey in the united states Well, there's no doubt that when he came to L.A., the focus was more on, okay, he before he was in Edmonton, and to them, it would be almost like a Canadian football league team. It's fine. He's great. But who cares here, unless you're a huge hockey fan. But when we went to the forum in those days, and I write about it in another future column, although a little bit about in this one in uh, Touching Greatness, the fact that President Reagan was coming to games regularly. Uh, He sat right behind the glass. And this was while he was still president, Gare. This is unbelievable. I mean, where does that, I got to be there for Wayne Gretzky, right? It was a happening. Anybody in Hollywood wanted to be seen there. It was similar to Magic Johnson, but the Lakers were already big. The Kings were just big within their piece of the pie in Southern California, but not after that, because it was, you got to see Wayne Gretzky. I'll never forget, scored a goal in his first, I think it was his first shift, if I remember correct, but certainly his first game uh, in LA. The place went nuts, and I got a chance to see him the rest of the time. I covered him before that, but just to be there during that period, if it wasn't for a little curved stick, I truly believe, and I mean strongly, the Kings would have had a title. They would have beaten Montreal in 93. Yeah, they would have had a Stanley Cup much earlier than the one they eventually exactly. captured. What I what I also really like about your book, Ted, is you explore some uh, areas of the human experience other than sports. Tell us about Laurel Canyon. Here's why. Like Steve Martin, long before he was a wild and crazy guy, you saw him. You saw him up close working out his act. When the Eagles were opening for Linda Ronstadt, you saw that. Tell us a little bit about the impact Laurel Canyon and what you saw up close from some of the entertainers who would go on to become the biggest of all time. Well, I grew up in Culver City, California, a suburb of L.A., which is uh, the home of MGM, the old MGM studios. So there was a lot of that going on in those days when I was a kid. And a lot of the TV shows, Desi Lou, you might remember from Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, Uh, that production company was just down the street from where I grew up. So we would hang out down there. Many of the TV shows, the Andy Griffith show and the Twilight Zone and a lot of those old 60s show, The Man from Uncle, which was one of my favorites, were, were all made there. And to me, it was like, okay, well, this is truly Hollywood, not Hollywood, Hollywood. Culver City was Hollywood, but we moved 
after junior high school, my mother moved to a, a different area, which got me closer to Laurel Canyon in the late 60s. And I had to hitchhike because I didn't drive yet. I had to hitchhike home every day down Sunset Boulevard, right past Laurel Canyon. Sometimes I took the bus to Laurel Canyon and Sunset and then hitchhike home. And to me, being in that area in the 60s, 68, 69, 70, the Troubadour was the place to be. That's where Linda Ronstadt, that's where James Taylor, that's where Glenn Fry and Don Henley met uh, uh, Linda Ronstadt there. And they ended up being in her band for several months until they created the Eagles. I was there for Linda's first concert with Henley and Fry in that band. So it was great. And I'll never forget it. She was wearing a short skirt and I joked it was shorter than my resume at the time. So that's not a bad thing. And, and, and uh, doing her thing in bare feet, which is the way she used to do it in those days, the Troubadour was unbelievable. And it was really sort of a dive, but it was the place to be. And when Steve Martin was coming up, and I saw him on TV one time. I said, I told my buddies, I said, we got to go see this guy. We're sitting in the front row of the Steve, early, early Steve Martin stuff. And I started to heckle him and he heckled me back. And he says, oh, I see you've had your first beer tonight, kid. And we went back and forth and back and forth. I'll never forget it. And uh, I have a little story about that in the book as well. But just to be there and little hockey tie in as well to the Eagles in the book. Gene Carr, the former LA King and New York Ranger, he gave me a couple of stories that he has never told publicly before. It's always been rumored, A New Kid in Town, the song by the Eagles, and also uh, the Tequila Sunrise, both were written and the title right there when he was hanging with Glenn Fry in his backyard. This is so fascinating. Uh, Gene Carr from Flin Flon, Manitoba, and now we're gonna cross a metaphorical <laughs> bridge and yes, fact, my cross, favorite bridge. and cross the Atlantic Ocean 5,000 miles away, Ted, to the windswept links of St. Andrews, Scotland. Love it. Home of the British Open next year, the 150th British Open, Tiger Woods. You saw Tiger Woods at a very young age. Tell us about that experience of watching Tiger and eventually seeing his road that took him to become one of golf's immortals. Well, I did cover Tiger from the first day that he took a swing on the PGA Tour at Riviera Country Club here in L.A. He was 16 years old. Uh, they gave him a sponsor's invite. And the whole thing, I just can never forget his dad saying, his dad Earl, who was a fascinating guy, and he was a, a military man. So he was a very disciplined person in many, many ways. But he wasn't afraid to tell us. Well, you know how great Tiger is going to be? He's also going to be the next Gandhi. It's like, uh, Gandhi, oh, can we first just get a, one good tee shot out of him? I'll worry about Gandhi down the road, right? Well, it was a zoo. It was following the Pied Piper at Riviera Country Club. And again, it was like the Gretzky thing. There was entertainment tonight and Hollywood Reporter and a lot of other outside the sports entities that were there covering this event. And I'm not really sure how they really knew about this kid so much if they weren't into sports. I knew about him because he was a local guy, but I didn't know he was going to be this good. I mean, you know, you just, you never know. Uh, a lot of people are hyped and they never make it big. But when Tiger came out that day, he just exuded just the, the passion and the confidence of very few 16 year olds. And Sam Sneed was there the, the, that week. He happened to be the honoree of the tournament at Riviera that week. And he's the guy that now is tied with uh, Tiger Woods all time and wins with 82. I love that tie in right there. I, I just hope that Tiger is going to be healthy enough to break that record someday. But, you know, we'll worry about that in the future. And, and speaking of health, uh, Tiger Woods, when you assess his career, and we know what happened in 2008 at Torrey Pines, how he somehow goes out there and, and actually, you know, wins the battle of wounded knee, so to speak. Can you take us back to that first day? Did you know then as a 16 year old that he, could you feel where, what his destiny would be that day? Well, you know, you could feel it, but I've seen too many flops. Uh, when you're born and raised in LA and you're in my business, everybody's hyped. So you try not to get too excited about, okay, well, this guy is going to be, you know, the next whatever. It doesn't mean anything until they do it. So I didn't get caught up into that. But I, obviously, I saw the talent. 
But sometimes people just flatten out. They never, ever get to their potential. And Tiger Woods was the kind of guy, he is so strong-minded and so, uh, you know, his will to win is like very few others. He and Kobe Bryant, probably the two most I've ever been a part of ever, that they just refuse to lose. Now, they don't always win, but I'll tell you what, they win more than most because they find a way. And that's the way in all of life. If, if you can't give up, just because, well, it might not be my day. The make it your best day you can possibly make it. Ted, we're in the latter stages of the fourth quarter, which brings us to historic Lambeau Field. Yes, the frozen tundra in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And I know you're a big fan of Aaron Rodgers, who shares your love for the Dodgers. But I want you to tell us a little bit, speaking of mystique and capturing something, what is it about Lambeau? What is it about the legend of Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers that still perpetuates to this day? I know when we went to the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame, the nine galleries, including the office of Lombardi, it was, again, unmistakable. It was touching greatness. How, oh, would, wow. you, how would you describe it for someone watching and being fascinated by Lambeau and the Packers mystique and aura, how would you put it into words? Well, first of all, I was lucky to grow up a Green Bay Packers fan in Los Angeles in the 60s, probably because my dad was just a huge football fan, liked to bet on a few games here and there, even more than here and there occasionally. So I watched a lot of games with his passion, but there was something different about Green Bay, knowing it was a small town, knowing what Vince Lombardi meant there. The guy was God there. Um, and I loved just the way they, they brought across their games nationally to us. You know, in those days, we didn't have many games. So it tended to be, why are the Green Bay Packers on all the time? You know, why not more of the Chicago Bears or the big city, New York? It was so much the Green Bay Packers because they were so good. And Vince Lombardi was the reason. And I had a great opportunity to meet with my boyhood idol, Bart Starr, in his hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, a, a year that he had his stroke and just a few years before he passed away. I was really fortunate, Gare, because that's another reason I wrote this book. When you get a chance to meet your boyhood idols and they turn out to be just as good as you hope, there are stories in there forever. And I talked to Bart about Vince Lombardi. And that interview is online, by the way, besides in my book, Touching Greatness. But the fact that he told me that Vince made them different because Bart was there when they were bad. And I mean, really bad. And he changed everything. So he created a small town thing with big town victories. And they became title town because they won so much. And Vince Lombardi created a lot of not just great players, but great business people. They are everybody who played for, I don't know of anybody who didn't say the rest of my life was different because of what Vince Lombardi taught me as a person, as much as a football player. And how much does that mean? And now let's really do a nice segue to finish up. Are you ready for this, Ted? Sure. Because you're from Los Angeles. And when we think of football, we think of the Rams. We think of Roman Gabriel. We think of Vince Ferragamo going to the Super Bowl, Jack Youngblood, Eric Dickerson, but way before those Rams, there was Elroy <laughs> Crazy Legs Hirsch with a connection to the University of Wisconsin. Why? We were talking yesterday. Why do people, anyone watching, why do they need to know about Crazy Legs Hirsch and what this represents in terms of creating legacy? Well, to me, Crazy Legs Hirsch is one of the many people that I mention in the book. And I, I like to have old references. First of all, I'm older, so I'm going to have a lot of older references if I'm going to read write about my life. But Crazy Legs was one of them that I mentioned. I had a connection to him because when I got my first real big time hockey play by play gig at the University of Wisconsin, he was their athletic director. So I got one time to meet him for more than a minute and go into his office and look around. And he had some pictures of his days with the LA Rams, which meant a lot to me, even though I was just a very little kid and hardly remembered him as a player. I remember, how do you forget the name Crazy Legs Hurts, right? So what I like to do in my book here, there's a lot of did you knows, 
and fun facts. And that to me is a chance to teach. And that's anybody, whatever age, but certainly if you're under age 40, you probably never heard of Crazy Legs Hurts unless you're a fanatic football fan for whatever reason, or, you love, or you're just a historian. So I'd like to mention the guy's name, tell him why he was great, why he belongs to be remembered so importantly. And there are tons of others in this book. I do the same. But Crazy Legs meant something to me. I got a chance to tell him that in person. He was sort of my boss, although I worked for the radio station. He overlooked the hockey program at University of Wisconsin. So it was always a pleasure. I used to hear stories, you know, he's sort of a figurehead. He doesn't do a lot there. Whatever. I didn't even care. I went in there. There was the old ram's horn on the hel helmet in his office. And that's what it meant to me. That is not only touching greatness, but that is historic stuff. And to this day, some of the great historians in the history of football say that guy was as good as anybody who ever lived catching a football. And I love being a part of that, as I did all the other greats. Ted, I know you feel strongly about this, that it's important, whether it's Crazy Legs Hirsch, whether it's Babe Ruth, all of the other luminaries mentioned in your book. Why are you so convinced that A, people need to know, young people need to know what came before them, and B, how would you define what is a legend? Well, I think people need to know because if they don't learn from experience and learn from our history, then how do you learn? And, and I've tried to be so accurate. Garrett, it took me three years to write this book, and more than half of it just researching because I wanted to be a thousand percent accurate. Accuracy, that is, is a word that we're starting to lose around our lives these days, and it's really bad. And, I'm, and same with journalism. That word may soon be in the trash pile, and it bothers me greatly. So what I did from a respect, and if you're going to critique somebody, you have to have facts behind the critique. Well, my book is all about facts besides my, my own stories. And to me, a legend is somebody that is so different. They're above the rest. They make something special out of their life, whatever it is. In my case, I'm talking sports. I'm talking music. I talk about the Rat Pack and having interactions with a few of those in Las Vegas. You know, I mean, I, I, it's so varied. It's not even funny. But to me, a legend is just somebody who is so much better than everybody. And not necessarily because they were born with it either. Obviously, a, a guy like LeBron James is born with talents that we can only dream of. I wasn't big. I wasn't that athletic. So I can only pretend in my dreams, but it's never going to happen. But if you're good at something and deep down inside, you know it, then make the most out of it. And that you can become your own legend. If you get to that point, whatever your business is, congratulations. If you don't, it's okay too, but get the most out of what you got. And to me, a legend is a guy that gets there. You know, Ted, again, we said it earlier, we could talk for hours, fill our viewers in, touching greatness. How do people go and get the book? How do they connect with you online? To me, you're so easy to talk to and connect with, but I want you to extend the invitation to our viewers and listeners. Well, I appreciate it. Touching Greatness, the book is on Amazon, but not Amazon in Canada, from what I understand. So for all you Canadians out there that would love to get the book and please check it out, it's at the publisher's website, Coach's Choice. That's C-O-A-C-H-E-S, coacheschoice.com. And you can get the book and there's free shipping right now to Canada. So uh, that's that's a value right there. But you can reach me at uh, on my Sports USA media website, uh, because I'm there all the time. I cover NFL and we just did the NHL as well. We did all of, uh, 29 games for the Stanley Cup playoffs and the Stanley Cup final. And Gare, you talk about touching greatness. This was, I've been around this game for a long time, but the first time I've been involved in a national broadcast of the Stanley Cup final. And folks, that means a lot to me. I loved every second of we're, we're going to try to get the, uh, the deal for next season. Hopefully that happens. But you get the book at those websites. Ted, promise us one thing, that you will come back and do Leaders and Legends someday. Anytime. I mean, tomorrow, I'll be there. <laughs> he, is, you, he is Ted Sobel. The book is Touching Greatness, Tales from the Front Row with Heroes and Legends. And we thank Ted so much for joining us from Los Angeles. And uh, again, thank you, as always, for watching Leaders and Legends, where you never know who you're going to meet or what you'll discover.